Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's good to see you here. It's good to see those of you here in the sanctuary, and also I welcome those of you who are worshiping online with us. Um, I hope that you'll, if you're online, leave a note there in the comments section to let us know you're here. And uh, if you're here in person, there are friendship pads along the center aisle, and you can sign those and let us know that you've been here as well. Uh, you all are watching COVID rates the same way I am, and uh, we're, I, I hope you can understand all of our precautions. We are not requiring, but we're recommending that everyone mask. Uh, all of our Sunday school classes have opted to go online today. Um, Loudon's and my fully vaccinated colleague, Rachel, still is testing positive for COVID after a week. Um, and there's just too many germs to be passed around. So we've opted to pass on doing communion again this week until it's, uh, until it's a little safer to do so. Remember, this is all about loving our neighbors and keeping one another healthy. Um, that means, again, this week that the bulletin will be correct up through the sermon and then just follow Loudon and me and take our lead and we'll, we'll get you through to the end. Um, as a reminder, there will be offering ushers with offering plates at the doors if you want to drop a check or an envelope in on your way out. And again, I thank you for your generosity. Let us prepare our hearts now for worship. Let us call ourselves to worship. Come from east and west, north and south. From everywhere God has placed us, with everything God has given us, as the people God made us, we come. Come, receive again the gift of grace, not for owning, not for boasting, but for celebrating, we come. Come, discover again the way that leads to life. Remembering who we are, seeking who we are yet to be, we come. Let us worship God.
we should not fear to face our sin, for such fear will surely drive us to anger. And in our anger, we too may try to drive Christ out of our lives and to throw Christ over the edges of our hearts. So instead, let us be reminded that sin will have no dominion over us, since we are not under the law, but under grace. So trusting in God's faithfulness, let us face our sin, claiming it before God and each other and humbling ourselves as we ask for th forgiveness. If you please join me as we say our prayer of confession this morning. Generous God, when we set our tables, we imagine who belongs. We are satisfied to welcome those whom we call our own. Our boundaries are drawn for our own family, our own congregation, our own neighborhood. We limit the seating to those who make us comfortable and lay out the welcome mat for those whom we choose to welcome. But your kingdom has no boundary. Before our birth, you have known, loved, and claimed each and every one. Soften our hearts to those we despise. Restore us to your vision of who belongs at the table. Renew us with your abundant mercy and love, which know no end. Friends, hear this good news. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. And this is the truth. In our Lord Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. invite all of our children to come forward for a special time with Miss Haley. Good morning. How you guys doing? Good. All right, what do you see? What have I drawn on this sheet of paper? What is that? A circle. Tell me something you know about a circle. What's the word for that? Do you know? Round. Round. A circle is round. A circle is a shape. Does my circle have any openings or closings to get in or out of the circle? No, it's one piece together line, and it has a clear inside and a clear outside. If I were talking to my boys and girls at school about a circle, I would say it's a closed shape. Now, what I'm about to say sounds kind of funny, but we as people, we know about shapes, but did you know that we often live in a circle? Did you know that? You did. As people, we have circles of people, people who we have inside our circle. And those people are our friends, the people we really like. It might be the people you play with in the playground, the people you go to church with who believe the same things that you do. We like those people inside our circle. It makes us feel safe and comfortable and good. And then there are those people on the outside of the circle, the people that can't get in because it's a closed shape. Those people on the outside 
are people that maybe they made us, ma- made us mad or angry or hurt our feelings, the people who believe different things that we do, people who don't look like us, even when we don't want to admit it, sometimes it's just people that we just don't like. It's hard to admit that sometimes. We like to think that we let everybody in our circle all the time, but it's not true. We all have people that we just want to keep at a distance. The scripture Miss Emily is going to read to us today reminds us, though, that that's not what God wants from us. In this scripture, Jesus reminds us that it's not just the people on the inside of the circle that he loves. It's the people on the outside. Jesus doesn't want us to live in a circle. He wants us to live in a shape like this, a shape that's a U, or maybe it's a squiggle, a shape that has no opening, a shape that has no closing. Now, I know some of you guys are really smart, and you're like, Miss Haley, there's a line. I can be on one side of the line or the other. And you can. But even when people believe different things and look different ways and they're on one side of the line or the other, when it's open, there's still a way around. There's still a way to invite the people on the other side to where you are. There's still a way to meet in the same spot and get to know each other. And that way is love. God's love in our hearts coming out in our lives and the choices we make to invite people who are different than us in with us, to invite us where we go so that we can share God's love for all of us with everyone. Will you pray with me? Dear God, give us the courage to push open the lines of our circles, to live in yous and squiggles where we may always find a way out and around to welcome one another together to live in your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our first lesson from Scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then into 13. Let us listen for God's word for us this morning. And I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have all faith, so to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, if I hand over my body so that I may boast and do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
gospel reading this morning comes from the fourth chapter of Luke's gospel. This is the continuation of a story we began last week uh, as Jesus comes to preach in the synagogue in Nazareth. Begin the reading in verse 21. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And God, if the words of this servant are not yours, then may you have a special word for us this day. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Never have I had such a disconnect between my own estimation of my abilities and the reality of those abilities than during recess on the elementary school playground. You remember recess, right? In particular, do you remember kickball? To this day, in my mind's eye, the pitcher rolls that red rubber ball to me. I make solid contact and the ball sails over the heads of the outfielders. The base is clear as I round third and head for home. <clears throat> That's the way it plays out in my head, at least. The reality was that as a child, I had terrible hand-eye coordination. I was 15th out of 16 on my junior high tennis team only because the 16th girl never showed up. Terrible hand-eye coordination. Foot-eye coordination was simply non-existent. When I came to the plate, I might putter the ball back to the pitcher and be tagged out, or often as not, swing my leg, miss the ball altogether, and land on my rear end on home plate. Now here's the other thing I'm sure you rem remember about kickball. Teachers in that day never did us the mercy, gave us the mercy of assigning teams. God bless them, they needed a break too, and so they just assigned team captains, and the rest of us endured the humiliation of being picked, or not. The popular and the athletic kids were always picked first. Since I was n neither, I was often the last one standing when some popular and athletic team captain would look at me and say, well, I guess that means you're with us. Show of hands, does this sound familiar to anyone? If so, I have good news. Jesus cares about people like us. Jesus cares about the ones picked last or left out altogether. Jesus cares about those everyone else has decided are losers. You know, the Bible is full of language about being chosen or selected or called or set aside for a particular purpose. 
Speaking through the prophet Isaiah, God says, I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. But God is also very clear that those people are chosen or called or set aside for a reason. To give light to the nations, Isaiah says. Presbyterians talk about election and the people of God being chosen for salvation and service. In other words, it's not just about making it across some goal line. It's not just about personal salvation. It's not just about me and Jesus. It's about carrying the grace of God to all those last ones picked, whether it's on the kickball team or in life. If you were paying attention last week, you remember that after reading from the scroll in the temple, Jesus sits down and says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the hometown crowd goes wild. Yes, they say, finally. After years of being told that nothing good could ever come out of Nazareth, they are finally getting a piece of the action. They're going to get God's power and blessing for themselves. You're our homeboy, Jesus, they say. We can't wait to see your best work happen here for us. In other words, pick us first for your team. But Jesus doesn't stop there. After some chitter-chatter among the worshipers in the sanctuary, he continues with this. The truth is, Jesus says, that there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Wait, what? you ever been somewhere when someone says something and all the other conversations stop? What? Say that again? Jesus reminds the people in the synagogue of some uncomfortable history. Their hero, Elijah, was sent to a widow, and remember, a widow had zero legal status in that day, and she was from Zarephath in Sidon, modern-day Lebanon. Elisha healed healed Naaman the Syrian, Syria, Syria. He may have been a military commander, but he was also an outsider. The word didn't even exist in that day, but today we'd probably just call them all Muslims and write them off. Wait, what? Picture yourself in that synagogue in Nazareth. The amens quickly turn into furrowed brows, silence, quizzical looks. The hometown crowd begins to get angry. Of course they know the stories of Elijah and Elisha. And of course they know that while Elijah and Elisha's work eventually touched Israel, neither of them started there. Neither of them treated their hometown people as the favored ones. Neither of them did their best, most powerful work at home. For Elijah and Elisha, the hometown folk were just one group among many. When Jesus reminds the people of Nazareth about those stories, his point is that his ministry will eventually touch their lives but it isn't going to start with them right away. And as we say around here, this is exactly when Jesus quits preaching and goes to meddling. God has not come just to us, he says, not just to the chosen people, not just to those who look like us or think like us or vote like us or believe like us. God's good news is for everyone, even Maybe especially, God's good news is for those we'd rather not have on our team. 
Shirley Guthrie, one of my professors at Columbia Seminary, used to tell a story about a political rally he attended in Atlanta in the late 1980s. No surprise, people were lined up, placards in hand, marching and shouting. I have no idea what the issue was, but it really doesn't matter. During the rally, a man on one side of the debate walked over to a woman on the other side. He told her he was a Christian and asked her if she was saved. She said she was, and that actually she was very involved in her church. The man asked if she knew that, what she, that she was going to hell for what she did at that rally. Quick on her theological feet, the woman replied that she looked forward to eating with him at the banquet table in heaven. And the man looked her right in the eye and said, If I get to heaven and you are there, I am promptly getting my hat and choosing to go to hell. Shirley says that man was so enraged that God's grace and blessing could include someone he was so sure was caught up in the work of sin and evil that he would choose condemnation over grace. Thirty years ago, I heard a colleague preach a sermon entitled, Circling the Wagons. I don't remember the context, I don't really remember anything about it, except for the sermon title. But that sermon title has gnawed at me for the last three decades. The phrase comes from the 19th century when wagon trains went west across the frontier. At night, pioneers would circle the wagons to protect themselves and their livestock, and of course, to keep out everyone who wasn't like them, especially Native Americans. It's a phrase that's culturally insensitive, and as far as the gospel is concerned, it's just plain wrong. Because Jesus, if Jesus tells us anything, it's that that's not an option. Uncircle the wagons, he says. Open yourselves up. God's grace is not anyone's personal possession. God's love is bigger than anything you can imagine. And there is grace enough for us all. Because in the kingdom of God, everyone is picked first. Amen. for a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, what more can we ask that we have not already received through our Lord? We know that your grace and love have no end. And because of this, we have hope in you. So today we pray for that which we know has an end even when we cannot see or even fathom it. We pray for the end of violence and bloodshed on the streets of our communities and in the communities of our neighbors, both near and far. We pray for the end of greed and poverty, for food on every table, for shelter from the storms, for wages that reflect our humanity more than profit margins, and for access to resources for those who need them most. We pray for the end of short-sighted decisions and long-term harm, for your wisdom for our leaders, your mercy for our laws, your compassion for the care of our planet and liberation of the captives and their oppressors. We pray for the end of injustice and the sin of racism, that we may love the fullness of each body which you shape and will into being. We pray for the end of illness and the agony of grief, that we may be reminded that yours is a love that bears all things 
helping us to endure beyond even the deepest valleys and our loneliest moments. And so we put our trust in you, O Lord, praying that all that must end be transformed by your purposes, hoping hoping beyond knowing that what will never end will continue to surround and guide us into the new kingdom that is and is to come. We ask all of this in the most holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, Paul encourages the Corinthians to strive for the greater gifts. Not gifts that we hold only for ourselves or bury in the ground to avoid the criticism of others. Greater gifts. Gifts that we share with one another for the glory of God and for the love of our neighbors and ourselves. So what might be those greater gifts for us this week? What might we share that God be glorified in our lives? If we're waiting on a sign, let it be it now. That this is the moment to bring our gifts to God. Amen. Jesus Christ, the love of God.